creation eternity in your hands you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to thanks you stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul now to stands walk in our sin and walk could I do but offer this heart oh God complete And what? 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Good to see so many here this morning, a few more in, because we, uh, we, we slightly wind the rows, but taken some rows out, so, uh, and kept some distance in as well, but we, uh, we're slowly getting there, aren't we? Praise God. Dell, I don't know if you had two Weetabix for breakfast or what, but them arms were, were going this morning. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Three shredded wheats, he says. <laughs> no cobwebs left anyway, that's all I can say. 
Praise God. No, it's great. It's fantastic. And uh, it's good. Um, just to give you an update on Tom, some of you will know, others won't know. Um, but uh, obviously Tom and Anna got married, as we know. And, and uh, it's great, isn't it? It's wonderful to get married. But then he's on honeymoon and he falls sick and ends up in hospital. Uh, but he's out of hospital. They've given him, uh, they put him on a drip, uh, took some bloods and uh, put some IV uh, painkillers in and given him some antibiotics and he's out again. And so, uh, so that's good, isn't it? And uh, not the way you want to spend your honeymoon. Uh, but, uh, but praise God, he's, he's doing well, and uh, he'll be back. Uh, whether he'll be, I don't think he'll be with us next Sunday morning because the flight doesn't land back in the country until late on Saturday night, um, and um, so uh, he'll be back in a couple of weeks' time. I wonder if you could turn with me to the book of Judges. And uh, this morning I want to speak to you on, I think one of my... I think not just my favorite, uh, yeah, sorry guys, we always forget this, don't we? If the youth want to go out, that's fantastic. And um, thanks, Peter. You do a good job, keep reminding me like that. <laughs> One of these days I'll be ahead of them and say, yeah, it's time for the youth to go out. Um, all our children are already out and uh, in the other room, so that's great, isn't it? But you know, the book of Judges is full of ordinary men and women who God chooses to do extraordinary things. You know, God just doesn't look for our ability. He looks at our heart and he looks at our availability. And, and the book of Judges is full of ordinary men and women who God chooses to do extraordinary things. In fact, some of them only appear at that moment. You know, there's been no run-up to it. They just suddenly appear. And, and this morning, I want to share with you about one of the characters who, who is in the book of Judges. And, and if you turn to the uh, Judges chapter 6, we'll find this character. His name's Gideon. And for those who may have been Christians for a long time, um, We'll, we'll know the story of Gideon or the account of Gideon. Because, you know, Gideon uh, so often is used in many different ways. But this morning, I just want to, I felt God want to just unwrap uh, some things. You know, one of the things we, one, what I've been doing over the last few weeks uh, when I've been speaking is speaking on identity. And, and who are we in Christ? Who are we in God? And last week when Mick, bless him, Mick Leggett uh, spoke well last week, didn't he? Really great. And uh, great to have Mick here. Uh, you know, but Mick, Mick spoke on the purposes of God. And, and, and I said a few weeks ago, I want to speak on identity and purpose. I've not got around to purpose yet, but Mick did last week. Um, so that was great, one of the things Mick said. Well, let me just give you a little bit of a background to judges. You see... Uh, judges that God, God put in place certain people to be a ju the judge or, or bring leadership to the nation of Israel at this time. They didn't have a king. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't necessarily God's um, desire that the nation of Israel should be governed by a king. That was the people's choice. If we go further down the road is when they, they chose Saul to be king. Um, but God's intent was to, to have judges and to have prophets in and around the people of God. And, and from time to time, then God would raise up a person to become judge over Israel. And, and it, what tended to happen is the people would slip away from God and then things would go wrong and they would cry out to God and God would hear their cry and God would send somebody to bring deliverance to the, the nation of Israel and, and they were in a bit of a cycle if, if, you know, if truth be known in this situation. But we get to this man Gideon and the background is that the children of Israel have, have wandered away from God and, uh, and every year what would happen is that the Midianites 
uh, which were a, 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 a group of people at the time, would come down and they would sweep into Israel every year at the time of the harvest, and they would come and they would take the harvest away, they would take all of their livestock, and they'd just come and, and, and just pillage the place and take everything away, all its wealth. And this happened for seven years. And, and the people of Israel had got themselves into a place where, where they were so fearful of what was going to take place that actually they, they'd started to build uh, houses in caves. They'd started to build uh, fortified places. They'd started to build in, in, in areas where they wouldn't normally live because they were so fearful of Midian coming down. And, and, and so the, the fear had caused them to change their behavior. And if we look over the last 18 months, there is no doubt that fear has caused this nation, us, to change our behavior, hasn't it? You know, we've changed our behavior because of fear, because fear has been, has been elevated in a lot of ways, hasn't it? And I'm not saying there wasn't some reality not some, but there wasn't reality in it. Of course there was. But, but one of the things that, that happened is that fear gripped the nation. You know, you would walk, walk down a street and, and somebody would be coming towards you and you didn't know whether to step into the road, whether to move back. You didn't know what to do. You, you change your behavior to match that circumstance at that time. And, and what was happening in the children of Israel was, was that this, this nation of Midian, now it's interesting because Midian was a son of Abraham. And, and, and so in some ways was related to the children of Israel through Abraham. But actually they become enemies over time. You, we can read it in the Word of God, what happened. And they, they became, instead of, instead of having good relationships, they became an, an enemy of Israel, and an Israel an enemy of Midian. And Midian would sweep down and take all of their belongings. But what happened was, it says in, in, uh, in chapter 6 there, that the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, this, there comes a time when we need to cry out to God. And we have been crying out to God, haven't we, over this period of time. But the, they came to a place here where they cried out to God. And you know, it says in, in the book of Chronicles, in 2 Chronicles 7 verses 13 to 14, it says, if, this is God speaking uh, to Solomon at the time, he says, if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locust to, to devour the land, or if I send a pestilence amongst my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Amen. Yeah, that needed an amen. Because, you know, if God's people who were called by his name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then God promises to hear from heaven and he will forgive their sins and heal their land. I would love God to heal this land. Amen? Amen. But we have a part to play in that. We have a part to play in God moving his hand over this nation. You know, there's something in me that... When I, was, when I was reading this and preparing this, and, and of course one of the big things with Gideon is God, God, God removes from Gideon any chance of Gideon saying, look what we did. Because actually what, Gideon, what happened with Gideon is God stripped, stripped it down from 32,000 warriors down to 300. Yeah. Yet God still won the battle. Because actually the battle belongs to the Lord. But God uses men and women to bring about what God wants to do. You know, um, it, says, it says there that what was God's response was this. In Judges 6 verse 8, that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, 
It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of all your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites or those whose land you live in. But you have not obeyed me. That's what the the word of the prophet was that came to the people. So fear was robbing them of their ability to do life. It changed the way they live. You know, they built strongholds and fortified to keep the Midianites out. They lived in caves in fear. And when we come across Gideon, Gideon's in a wine press threshing wheat. Now, I don't know if you've ever threshed any wheat. I want to tell you this. I haven't either. Okay. (laughs) But when you thresh wheat, the idea is that actually you you sort of hit the wheat to release the, uh, the kernel, and then what you do is you throw it up into the wind so that the chaff is blown away and, and the, the wheat seed comes down, and there, there it separates the chaff from the wheat. Now, a wine press was a big hole in the ground where they would put the grapes, and you would get in and you would tread, tread away at the grapes to release the grapes. It was a hole. Now, you see, he was hiding in this hole, threshing the wheat. Yeah? Now, I've not known there'd be much wind in a hole. You know, the wind tends to be above the hole, and so, so this is hard work. And, and old Gideon is, is having to work three times harder than he should have done to get this job done. And why is there in, in the hole, along comes the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord appears at the side of the wine press. And he says this to Gideon, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now, I think Gideon gives it some Yeah, I don't know if he gets on the ladder out of the wine press just to see if, the, if there's anybody else there that the angel's speaking to. Because at this moment in time, Gideon felt anything but a valiant warrior. The word valiant means able, strength, strong. The whole of the nation is hiding from Midian. I think Gideon's response was very interesting. In Judges 6, 11. He says to the angel of the Lord. Oh my Lord. If the Lord is with us. Why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about. Saying did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt. But now the Lord has abandoned us. And given us into the hands of the Midians. I'm not sure that I, if the angel of the Lord appeared to me, that that would be my response. You know what I mean? To have a go, to have a go back at him. <laughs> you, know, you ever had a go back at God? Yeah. I have occasionally. I always find that God wins, though. Um, you know, you can have an argument with, with, with God, but the, the thing is that, unfortunately, God's always right. I mean, I mean you, know, you know that, Philip. He's always right. Yeah, it just needs a bit of time for us to get our minds in line with what God wants us to do. And, and, but here we are, we've got Gideon, and he's saying, but oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, as you say, why then has all this happened to us? And I guess some of us might have asked over this period of time, why has this happened to us? You know, and I don't believe that God sent what's happened. Right? I don't believe that for one minute, friends, but I do believe that God has used it to do something about staring the church of Jesus Christ across the world. He's done something with it to cause us to refocus who we are as the church of Jesus Christ. You know, he wants us to get out of our strongholds. You know, and sometimes this, 
this building can become a stronghold. You know, I'm, and I'm not against us gathering together. The first thing I said this morning was it was good for us to gather together. But this is a place where God comes to, to equip us to go out there and do what God wants us to do. You know, this is not the place that God intends us to live. You know, this is, the, you know, but God intends this to be a place where we, where we meet with him and God does the way, whatever he does, but then we go out into the world around us. What has happened? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about? And you know, friends, sometimes, you know, I've, I've heard people say that. Well, where, where are the miracles? Where are the miracles? Where are the miracles that the Word of God talks about? Where are the miracles? Where's, where is blind Bartimaeus that, 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 that Jesus bent down and touched him and healed him? The lame that was lowered through the ceiling to Jesus. And Jesus touched him and he got up and he walked. And, and, and sometimes we ask ourselves those questions. And where are the miracles? Well, I know that in this building today, there are people that could come up here and testify of God doing a miracle in their life. Yeah? This Kedia who was on his deathbed, and yet God raised him up <laughs> within hours. Yeah? <laughs> this morning, Linda was sharing about, great to see David and Linda. Come on, let's, let's give them a clap. So. Linda was sharing about her sister that they went up in June. They got a phone call to go up. They, they told her to expect the worst. And so they're driving up there and they get there to the hospital. They get into the hospital and the sisters sat up in bed. Fine. <laughs> well, not fine, but, but certainly not dying. And, um, and, and, uh, and sorry, Linda, if I... Hopefully I relate what you told me earlier, not quite word for word, but in the, the oldness. But, but a daughter had sat at the side of a, a mum's bed the night before praying for a mum. And the nurse had heard a daughter praying for a mum, for God to touch a mum. Because everything was beginning to close down in her body. Everything. And she's there and she's crying out to God for a mum. And the nurse overhears this and and the nurse, the nurse relays this to, uh, to, um, to Linda the next day that, uh, that this is what happened and, 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 uh, or to a daughter and said, you know, I heard you praying. I heard you praying last night. And what has happened to your mum is nothing short than your prayers being answered. Yeah. And one day maybe Linda will come up here and share that in a better way than I have done. But friends, I want to say that God is still at work. And God is still doing miracles in our lives. You know, and, and I know there are others who would testify that this morning to what God is doing. Hallelujah. You know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Word of God tells us that. Yeah, Jesus says, greater things will you do if I go to the Father. You see, God has not stopped doing miracles. God has not stopped doing miracles in people's lives. But God continues to do miracles. And I know that there are people that would say, well, but miracles were for, for years ago. Friends, that makes a mockery of the Word of God. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, why would He stop doing miracles? Because the Word of God tells us God is not a liar. Yeah? He doesn't lie. He can't lie. You know... And, and so God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I know, and I have seen, and I was, I was in a meeting in, in, um, in Birmingham when Reinhard Bonnke was preaching. And Reinhard Bonnke comes on the stage in front of, I don't know what the stadium holds, maybe 10,000 people. And there he is, and he's preaching. And, uh, and, and at the end of his message, he points to a lady in a wheelchair and he says, I'm going to come down and I'm going to pray for you. And he gets off the platform 
And he goes down and he gets to this lady and she's in a wheelchair and he, he, he puts his hands on her and prays for her, grabs her hand, lifts her up and she walks out of a wheelchair. Yeah? And not only did she walk out of the wheelchair but she walked up onto the stage and within five minutes she's running across the platform. I was there when it happened. Friends, and I've, I've, and I've seen God do the miraculous. Not just in that instance, but in other instances. But you see, Israel had got them to a, themselves to a place where actually, where are all the miracles? Because why has this happened to us? Well, the why it had happened to us because they turned their back on God. They turned their back on God. And actually, they'd started to worship false gods. And you know, friends, when... when Sometimes when we don't see the miraculous happen, we, we, we can get a little bit delusion, delusion, <laughs> disillusioned, that's a better word. <laughs> and and we, 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 we put our trust in other things. But I want to say that my God, your God, our God, is still a God of miracles. Amen? He is. And he's still doing miracles throughout the world. And I, I, I firmly believe in, friends, that we will see the miraculous take place amongst us. Amen. And you say, well, Pastor, that's a big statement. Peter's a miracle already sat here amongst us. Amen. Yeah? And Peter can give a testimony of, of uh, having a skin disease when he was younger and this being a, a very all over his skin. And a couple came and they said to him, uh, we've come to pray for you because we believe God says, like layman, you need to go and shower. And as you shower, God's going to do something. And Peter went and, and, and obeyed what they asked him to do. You know, imagine somebody coming to your house, mate. Sorry, I don't know you. But somebody coming to your house and saying, look, I've come and uh, God tells me you've got to go and have a shower. Right? You, you'd sort of think, yeah, cuckoo. Where's this guy landed from? You know. But Peter had got this ailment and this couple came and he responded to the word of God in faith, went and had a shower and all of a sudden all this skin began to, dry skin began to drop off his body and his, and his skin became as new. Amen, that's right Peter, isn't it? And not had, a, not had a repercussion of that in his life for I don't know how many years. 33 years. Now that is God. Yeah? But sometimes, friends, like the children of Israel, we, we, we've got to the place where we're not expecting God to do something. We're not expecting Him to do something. But I want to say that He's the, God, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You see, there He is in this place. And the angel of the Lord comes to him. You know, there are people that say, as I've said, that miracles are not for today, friends. <laughs> it says in, in the book of Timothy, let me read this from 2 Timothy. Right? 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. The, the heading at the top of the uh, the little portion of scripture there is difficult times will come. <laughs> it says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than love, lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness although they deny, deny its power. Avoid such men as these. Friends, I do not want to have a form of godliness, talk about God and deny the power of God in our meetings. I don't want, I want us 
to be a people, and I know we are, we are Pentecostal people, aren't we? Okay. It says Elam Pentecostal Church on the outside. You know, the Pentecostal Church believes in a God who is, who is a healing God. Yeah? And, and, and that is one of the things. Okay. You know, it says it up there, look. Savior, healer, baptizer, coming king. If you've never noticed that on the way out, that's what it says. That's the four things that we, we believe God uh, send our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we have a healer, that he's a baptizer, and he's our coming king. One day he's going to return, amen? Yeah, and if we know Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior, we'll go to be with him. And if we die before that time, well, then, then we will also be, if we know him as our Savior, we'll be in glory with him, hallelujah. You know, and our sister Olive is in glory, hallelujah. And we had to change the funeral because my son caught COVID. <laughs> and we had to isolate. And we looked at, I asked Pastor Ian if he'd take, uh, take the service, but he didn't feel he could. And so we, we got back to this position where we, where we are. And, and, and our sister Olive's funeral is a week on Wednesday, on the 4th, okay, <laughs> at 10 a.m. here in the building. Okay, and if you want to come, you are welcome to come. All right, and, uh, but our sister Olive is in glory, you know, and hallelujah. And, um, but it says difficult times will come. Well, difficult times have come. And if you read that list, it's as if Paul was talking about today, isn't it? But I want to say, friends, that, that, that we want to see the power of God in our midst, working in us and through us. I believe that the power of God is here to transform people's lives, to heal the sick, to set the captive free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to comfort those who mourn. Our God is a God of miracles. I believe in the power of God. You know, uh, but fear, fear robs us of faith if we're not careful. Judges 6 verse 14. I like this. I like this because as I was preparing this, God, I felt God, the Holy Spirit, just challenged me in this, this. He says, the Lord looked at him and said, go in your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? The Lord looked at him and said, Gideon's there. He's still in the wine press. The angel of the Lord. There's a whole thing there about the angel of the Lord being a Christophany, which is a, a pre, pre, uh, pre-incarnate um, appearance of Christ. But it says the Lord. It doesn't say the angel of the Lord looked at him. It says the Lord looked at him. The Lord looked at him straight in his eye. He looked at Gideon straight in his eye. And he says, I am with you. I am with you. Go in this, your strength and deliver Israel. He looked him in the eye. He looked him in the eye. And I felt God, the Holy Spirit, quickened me when I read this, that God wants to look some people in the eye this morning and speak into your life and say, God is with you. Go in your strength and deliver. Whatever God is telling you to do, do it. God is looking in your eye and saying to you, do it. I am with you. I am with you. (laughs) Daniel Alexander, I felt God specifically put you on my heart this morning to say, God is with you. God is with you as a couple. And different ones. That just wasn't for them this morning. But I felt God specifically wants to say to somebody and look you in the eye. And say I am with you. I am with you. You see. There are times. Friends when God lays a scripture. We know. You see this. Sorry my Bible's here isn't it. This Bible is full of words. 
But it's not just full of words. It's full of the words of God. That's what makes it different to any other book. There's been more copies of the Bible sold in the world than any other book. And nothing ever comes close to it. See, in here is the word of God. Now, it's the Logos. It's the written word of God. But at times, God takes the written word of God and makes it what we call the rhema word of God. Because God highlights the scripture to us as we read it. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit highlights it in a way that it, that it bang, something happens inside of ourselves. And we know that God at that moment is speaking directly to us through his word. You see, God is living. This word is living and active and true. And it will accomplish what God wants it to do. And, and this morning, friends, God is speaking to some people. And, and God has already been speaking to you. But God is looking you in the eye this morning and saying, I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> he asked him to go and deliver Israel. But you know... <laughs> He, uh, verse 15, he said, O oh Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. You see, Manasseh was a half-tribe, right? He, they, they were the two sons of Joseph, the half-tribes, one of those being Manasseh. And so he came from an half-tribe, and he says, my family, is the, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I'm the youngest of the least family. In other words, <laughs> I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. Why have you come to ask me? You know, I've got an older brother. Why didn't you? Have? But God says, uh, God says, I've come to you, and I'm speaking to you and saying, I am with you. you. You see, so often, friends, we, we, we look at ourselves and we see ourselves as nobodies. But God sees the potential in each and every one of us to do something in the kingdom of God. I want to say that nobody is a nobody in the kingdom of God. Nobody is a nobody. God has got something for each and every one of us to accomplish in the kingdom of God. Yeah? And, and, and yet here is Gideon saying, oh, but Lord, why ask me? <laughs> you can see me, I'm, I'm hiding in this. And, and he, he, he was having a real identity crisis. You know, how, how often, you know, he almost said, Lord, you've got to be kidding Really? But you know, how often does God use <laughs> nobodies? Yeah. I mean, Noah just appeared on the scene and God said to him, Noah, I want you to build an ark. I mean, at that time, they'd never had any rain on the earth. It's, you know, God turns up to this man, Noah, who, Noah the nobody, and says, Noah, I'd like you to build an ark. What's an ark, Lord? Oh, I'll give you the design. And, and, and in obedience, he sets out and he builds this great big ark that we would call a boat, right? And, and they didn't, you know, he builds it in the middle of nowhere. Why? Because God wants to use Noah to redeem mankind at that time, in that way. God took Joseph out of the pit and made him a prime minister. God took him out of the pit and made him a prime minister in Egypt. He was nobody. He wasn't even an, an Egyptian. Right? He, he, his, his brothers had thrown him in the pit. They'd left him for dead. He was bought by slave traders. He was taken into captivity. And we know, we know the ups and downs of Joseph's life. He ends up in prison. 
you know, and, and he, he, he thinks his opportunities come because he's, he's, he's given the answer to two dreams and, and yet God, he, he stays in prison and then one day, one day, the moment that God has been preparing his whole life for comes and God takes him from the prison, from the pit, to become prime minister in one day. He took Gideon from the wine press to be a deliverer of Israel. He took David from the fields to become a king. He took Peter from a fishing boat to lead the early church. He took a baby in a stinking, stinking stable to become the savior of the world. And, and of course, this baby wasn't nobody. It was the Son of God. But wrapped up in the vulnerability of a little baby. You see, life is not about where you start. It's about how you finish. It's not where you start, it's how you finish. It's where you finish. There's lots of people who have had bad starts in life. There's lots of stuff. There's lots of people a bit like, <laughs> a bit like Joseph. Stuff's happened. Yeah, and, and I guess at times Joseph said to God, God, it feels like you've abandoned me. <laughs> Lord, where are you? But actually, God took him from the prison and made him the prime minister of Egypt. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it, God is incredible, friends, because in the, it wasn't just about saving Egypt, but it was about bringing the children of Israel to have food as well. God, God, but, but friends, it isn't where we start, it isn't what's happened to us, it's how we finish that is the most important thing. How are you finishing? Where are you going to finish? Because God wants you to finish well. God wants you to finish well. He doesn't want you to finish badly. And, and I think, you know, different people have told me about Olive. <laughs> you know, um, Ali rang her during the lockdown. So to I don't know how many times, but but uh, Olive says, oh, 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 I'm 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 just I'm just she says I'm just praising God in my kitchen, she says I'm just singing away to the Lord in my kitchen, you know, and and I want to say that, that there's a sense that Olive ran her race and she ran it well and she ran it to the end, amen. And and. Laid up in heaven is a crown of righteousness that's waiting for her. She ran the race well. She's going to get a well done now, good and faithful servant. Enter in. You see, it's not where we start, friends. It's how we finish. And, and God, I just felt God wanted you to know that today. And God wants some of you to know that it's not where you started. It's how you finish. Okay. <laughs> It's not where you start, it's how you finish. The world would tell you that your, your path is, is already because of your cultural background and this rubbish. It's absolute rubbish in God. God takes the weak things of this world and makes them strong. God takes the foolish to confound the wise. You see, God uses uses somebody who ended up down working down the coal mines to stand here this morning. I had, th I had 14, 15 years working down the coal mines. Lots of people won't even know what a coal mine looks like nowadays. Okay. All they see is this little piece of metal that sticks out of the ground and says, such and such a colliery used to be here. You know, oh, is it? What, what does that mean? 
let me tell you, working down the coal mine is, is filthy, horrible, hot job. That you, you know, um, <laughs> wow. But there were times, friends, I was only saying this to Sam in the week. I was talking to Sam on the phone. And, uh, you know, Psalm 139 became my reality. Yea, thou they are going to the deepest depths of the earth. Behold, thou art with me. And there were times in the very depths of the, of the ground working down the coal mines that I suddenly became aware of the presence of God with me. And I want to say that I didn't grow any bigger, which was a good job because it was pretty low at times, but I grew inside. I knew the reality of God with me. And I used to begin to worship and praise God in the midst of the, the darkness of the coal mine. And, and, and my, my colleagues and people, they, they used to call me the singing miner. Okay, I didn't know I was singing, right? David, you've got a good voice. Oh, how do you know? Well, you've just been singing for the last half hour. You know, I just used to sing naturally. Yeah, because actually I couldn't contain what God had done in my life. <laughs> he takes the insignificant people and makes them significant in his destiny. You see, God doesn't want our ability. He wants our availability. Sometimes we think we've got to do this, that, and the other before we can do it. God says, your most important attribute is your availability. Your availability. Not your ability. God wants us to be available to him. You see, one of the next things that happens is, uh, but is that Gideon, in verse 22, he says this. When Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the face of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, Peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And then it says, Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it, The Lord is Peace. And it says it's there to this day. It's where we get our title, Jehovah Shalom. This portion of scripture. God is peace. The Lord is peace. The, the, what, it actually, what it actually means there, peace, is wholeness, completeness. It does mean peace in the sense of of peace but it means that God spoke into the very depths of Gideon said do not fear you will not die wow <laughs> and it said that the Gideon then built an altar to the Lord and named it the Lord is peace. You've heard me say, friends, before <coughs> that nothing alters without an altar. Nothing alters without an altar. And I think there that day, Gideon built an altar to God. And at the altar, he laid it all down. He laid it all down at the altar and said, Lord, here I am. Use me. Take me. See, nothing alters without an altar. If we don't let go of some of these things that have held us, then they will continue to hold us. 
But maybe those things that have held you back, maybe your insecurity, maybe words that people have spoken over your life that have said to you in the past that, that the devil so often reminds you of, I want to say lay them at the altar before God and say, God, I'm going to give this to you. Lord, I'm laying it on the altar. And quickly, I'm going to finish this story today. You see, God asks us to do small steps of faith towards a big thing. <laughs> and what he, the first thing that God asked him to do was to go and pull down the false gods of his father, of himself. And so he goes in the night and he pulls down the false gods and he builds another altar and he makes another sacrifice. And then God calls him to go and take on the Midianites. And there he is. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we said that God didn't want him to do it in his own strength. But what he did, he, he didn't, he, he wanted... He wanted again to know it was God. So he did what he called, he put down a fleece. And, and he put down a fleece of an animal on the floor. And he said, Lord, if this is really you, I want to wake up in the morning and it to be dew around the fleece and the fleece to be dry. So he wakes up the following morning and it's dry and it's wet. Like, yes, God. But he thought, well, okay, God, just in case that couldn't happen, I'm going to ask you now to make the fleece wet and the ground dry. So the next morning he gets up and, and there it is. The fleece is wet, the ground is dry. And so he, he, he starts to get an inkling that this might be God, you see. Friends, and sometimes, you know, people say, well, I'll put a fleece out to God to make a decision. It's an interesting way to make a decision in God, for one. But... Let me say, if you put a fleece out with God, make sure there's a God factor in it. Right? So I'll give you a little example. Don't say to God, God, go out to, you know, front of the building this morning, this afternoon, morning, whenever it is, I don't know. Um, if it keeps on speaking, it'll be afternoon. Uh, but <laughs> go out the front of the building and and say, Lord, if there's a black car in the next five, I'll know it's you that's been speaking to me. Because there's a good chance that there'll be a black car in the next five cars. Yeah? There's no God factor in there. Now, there is maybe a bit of a God factor. God, if the next 50 cars are all black, I'll know it's you. Right? So 50 cars come down and they're all black. Right? You say, well, God, just in case that wasn't you, Lord, can the next 50 all be white? What I'm saying is, and you, you say, Pastor, that's stupid. That's never going to happen. Well, that's exactly it. If you were putting a fleece out before God, make sure it cannot happen in the, in the natural. Make sure it cannot happen in the natural. That the only answer that you are looking for is a supernatural answer from God. Amen? Don't put a fleece out that says, well, probability says that this could happen one in 10,000. The probability says it's impossible. Yeah? But all things are possible with God. And yet sometimes people, people come and they say, well, we put a fleece out before God. Pastor, and it's so... I says, what was the fleece? I says, guys, it has to have a God factor. It has to be big enough that the only answer you're getting is from God, not from man. And God whittled, whittled it down. Imagine, it says, and I brought this with me this morning, okay. <clears throat> it says that he got a trumpet, and he blew a trumpet. Now, when I practiced this morning, I want to say, the first three times I blew this, it worked. The next 20, it didn't. Okay. So, I'm not sure what the probability is, but here goes. Okay. Yeah. It's a bit like... Uh, no. 
next 22 times I blew it. gathered the people together and 32,000 people came. And God says, that's too many. He says, ask who's fearful amongst them and send them off home. So 22,000 put their hands up. Yeah. Oh, well, you go back home. And it's not that God didn't use them. God did use them later. Okay. It's now we're down to 10,000. And God says, that's still too many. <clears throat> he says, I want to put a test before them. He says, ask them, he says, they're thirsty now. He says, ask them to go down and get a drink. And he says, I'm going to tell you which ones I want to keep. And so they went and they got a drink. And they, some of them just dived in there. But others picked it up in their hands and they, they lapped it. 300 of them. And God says, I want those 300. 300, Lord, are you? I mean, there's, there's like, you know, there's 100,000 Midianites and 300 of us. I want to say that one man with God is a majority. Yeah. And, and finally, my point is this. That God doesn't always send our miracle in the way we are expecting it. Yeah. Because if you go into battle, the normal way to go into battle is to go in bat into battle with a shield, shield and a sword. God said to Gideon, he says, right, with your 300 men, I want you to split them into three, give each one of them a trumpet, give them a jar with a candle in. And by this time, I think Gideon's thinking, well, whatever you want me to do, God, I know you're going <laughs> to, yeah, you promised me I'm not going to die. You see, God doesn't always bring it the way we expect it. But God had already been planning Gideon's miracle before ever Gideon was born. And I want to say that God's already planning your miracle. Yeah. God's already. And it may not come the way you expect it. Right? Be expectant in God because one day God is going to say it's time to blow the trumpet. And that's what Gideon said. He says, when I give the signal, I want you all to blow your trumpet and all to smash your jam jar. And the hundred thousand of them were defeated. And it says that Gideon was judge over Israel for the next 40 years. wants to blow a trumpet over your life. Give you a victory in Christ. Through Christ. Give him the glory. Lift up his name. Hallelujah. Who is like our God? There is no one who is like our God. And I don't know what the victory is that you need in your life. But God does. Wow. But God does. Lord, I thank you that you are already at work on our behalf. Lord, that you're speaking to some people this morning. You're looking them in the eye and you're saying, God is with you. I'm with you. God says, I'm with you. Lord, for other people, Lord, you are saying, you are Je Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. He wants to bring wholeness to who you are. Not just a peace from whatever's happening. But he wants to bring a peace inside of you 
And he wants to bring a wholeness to who you are. Maybe you need to make an altar to him. I don't mean build one, I mean come to him. Maybe you need to hear that trumpet blown over your life because God wants to do something miraculous for you. He is a miracle working God. He takes, Lord, thank you that you've taken so many others, Lord, who have had a past, but you've given us a future. <laughs> You've exchanged our past for a future in you. Lord, you've taken some of us who the world would look at and give not even a second glance to us as a nobody, but Lord, you've said, I'm going to take that person and I am going to use them in my kingdom. Lord, I pray that as you're speaking to people this morning by your Holy Spirit, that you would seal your word Water it by your Holy Spirit. Cause it to grow and flourish, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want um, Leo and Lucy to come down to the front, please, guys. And uh, <laughs> um, what I'm about to do in, in one way, it saddens me. <laughs> you guys know that, okay. Um, but in another way, I want to make sure that we, we bless these folks. Today is Lucy and Leo's last day with us. Okay. Um, we've had a chat a few weeks ago, and, um, and uh, they just feel at this time that they want to, uh, it's time for them to move on, and we've had a chat about that. But Leo and Lucy are a great couple. I love you. Okay? Don't ever forget that. All right? Yeah? This ugly man loves you. Did I call myself ugly then? Did I get it wrong? But, but I love you guys. Okay? I want to say thank you on behalf of the church for serving us. Okay? And for doing what you have done so faithfully. You know, and so skillfully. God has given you gifts and talents to be used for him. Do not bury them. I told you this. Yeah? Do not bury your gifts. Yeah? But allow God to use them. Yeah? Let them flourish in God. All right? And we're sad that they're not going to be used here. Right? But I want to, I want to honor you this morning and to pray for you and to bless you as you leave here. Because I'm a big believer is the way you leave is the way you enter. Yeah. And I want to give you the best chance of entering somewhere. Well. All right. Okay. So if you don't mind, I'm going to come around back and lay hands on you. All right. Because I don't want to breathe on you. <laughs> Lord, stretch your hands out towards them, guys. Will you? Lord, I thank you for Leo and Lucy. Thank you, Lord God, that earlier in the year that the two became one. Lord, married before you, and Lord, uh, what a wonderful day that was. But today, Lord, as they leave us, I want to pray over them a blessing. I want to send them out with a blessing. Lord, I want you to bless them in body, in soul, and in spirit. I pray, Lord God, that, that Lord, you'll give them a, a new home but it will be home. Lord, and I pray, Lord God, that, that they will prosper there. Lord, and the gifts will be, uh, will be released for you and for your kingdom, Lord. So, Lord, bless them, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Thanks. You know, um, <laughs> I want us to pray for some people before we finish this morning. I will finish. But I do want us to pray for Peter. I want us to pray for Sam. I want us to pray for Miracle. 
Yeah. Uh, I want us to pray for um, a family that have recently been coming. Uh, Maria, Mariaz. And Mariaz this week had his first session of chemo on Friday. Um, and uh, I want us to pray. F- I want us to pray for all four of those people this morning. And maybe yourself. Maybe you've got some ailment. Maybe when I pray, you put your hand on wherever that is. But I want to pray, and I'm believing for a miracle, friends. <laughs> and uh, let's pray, Lord. We've talked about miracles, Lord, and we proclaimed that you are still the God of miracles, the God of the miraculous. Lord God, and we pray into, uh, we have named these people before your throne this morning. Lord, and we, we are seeking your face as your word of God tells us to do. And so, Lord, we pray for Peter this morning. I pray, Lord God, a miracle into his life, Lord God. Thank you for what you've done. But, Lord, we pray, Lord God, that you would touch him. Lord, we stand against this diagnosis in the name of Jesus. Lord, for Sam, we thank you for Sam. Lord, thank you uh, for the giftings and the talents that he has. But Lord, we come to you and ask for a miracle for Sam. Lord God, we ask for a miracle for this young man. Lord, we don't know how you're going to do it. Lord, and sometimes it doesn't come the way we want, but, but Lord, you do it. <laughs> Lord, we're not worried about that, but we're just asking for a miracle. Lord, for a miracle. Lord God, we bring this young woman to you. Lord, her name is Miracle. <laughs> Lord, she, she, she has that name. She carries it. Lord, I pray for a miracle in miracle's life. Lord God, we pray. Lord, for Marias. Lord God, we pray, Lord God, that you would touch him in his body miraculously. Lord, when I text him this morning, Lord, he, will, he just says, just thank the people, will you? So, Lord, we we just pray, Lord God, you'll touch him and minister to him in Jesus' name. Bring a miracle, Lord, and other people in this congregation this morning or watching online this morning. Lord, I pray for a miracle in their lives, whatever that means to you. But, But I pray, Lord God, you would touch people. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, may the Lord bless you. Wow. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. Jehovah Shalom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, we're not handing the offering basket round at the present, but there is a basket at the front, there is a basket at the back. Please, if you would leave any gifts or tithes or offerings in those, that would be great. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for being here this morning. Praise God. I know that this man has spoken too long this morning, but hopefully God has spoken to you. Amen. Have a great week. Pray for the Romanian church this afternoon. They're meeting and, uh, and praise God. Thank God for them. And Lord bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Great to see you guys. <laughs>